There's an expression in basketball that shooters shoot. And in the first two games of the Eastern Conference Finals, the Bucks' Chris Middleton didn't live up to his regular season form. He was 12 of 36 from the floor. He had scored a combined 30 points in the first two games. Not what you expect out of an all-star. But he stayed aggressive last night, and he kept shooting. He had 15 to 26. He scored 38. He scored 20 in the fourth quarter. And he always reminds you of how good he can be. Two-time All-Star, and he's going to play on the Olympic team. Hawks, they played tough. They ran out of steam. Trey Young twisted his ankle in the second half. But Middleton's shooting was big. Giannis played well. Bobby Portis played well. You got big contributions off the bench. But, the you know, teams need a closer in the playoffs. And as strange as this is going to sound, Chris Middleton, to me, is more of a closer than the Greek Freak is. Greek Freak is a better player, but as I've been saying a couple of times during the postseason, if Chris Middleton plays well, the Bucs win. And if you watch Chris Middleton, he doesn't think he is the second fiddle here. He has that mentality, and he should have that mentality. Look, you're not going to be famous. You're going to be dwarfed by the Greek Freak. But you have a chance to make a name for yourself. And by doing this and then doing it on a bigger stage in the NBA Finals, that's where you make a name for yourself. And that'll be a coming out party possibly for Chris Middleton. We've talked about some of these players with Trey Young, with Chris Paul almost, you know, 15, 18 years where you, you become an overnight sensation. But Chris Middleton, what he did, that, that's a big moment here. Now, look, for the Atlanta Hawks, they're not a great team. And... That they've gotten this far is miraculous because they don't have, like, that's an injury plague team. And Trey Young uh, twisting his ankle, and they may limp home, but they'll limp home with pride, and they should. But the Milwaukee Bucks, and I thought at the beginning of the year, or beginning of the postseason, the, the healthiest team was going to win the NBA championship. And that might be the Milwaukee Bucks. But man, is this, like, there is. This is fraught with tension and, and the what-ifs. If Kevin Durant hits a three instead of a two, then it's over. Like, Mike Budenholzer probably loses his job as the head coach of the Bucs. If Kawhi Leonard doesn't get injured, are we looking at a different story out west? Anthony Davis doesn't get injured. I mean, there's... There's so much that's gone on with these playoffs here. But it might be the healthiest team is going to win the championship. And that team right now is the Milwaukee Bucks. McLevin, uh, what poll question are we going to go I with? I had to put up. Okay. It, it totally, going from a great announcement to something completely petty. But has Paul George had a good uh, postseason? Actually, it's 50-50. People can't decide. I think he's done. He sort of carried this team to some extent, even though he can't hit the side of a barn sometimes. <laughs> Without him, they're just they're sort of a bunch of no names. The Clippers are zero for twelve in the fourth quarter on shots that could have tied the game or taken the lead. That's the most attempts without a make in the fourth quarter of a game over the last twenty five years. You're looking for a clutch gene with somebody here, and. With Without Kawhi there, I mean, Paul George, it, it's his team, and he does have to take all of these shots. He's taking shots, more shots than he would normally take. And would you like a little bit higher percentage? Yes, you would, but it's not going to be there. But I, 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 I'm going to give him credit here because he is out there, and they're still alive. And, you know, obviously a big game coming up tonight with Game 5. Do I expect the Clippers to win this series? I do not. I think the bigger picture moving forward here is who are the Clippers moving forward? Is Kawhi always going to have this knee injury? And the answer is yes. Now what do you do? How do you build around Kawhi Leonard? And Or does Kawhi Leonard go someplace else? I think really the, the future, the identity of the Clippers is, is what's on the line for me. Who stays, who goes. I think Ty Lue has done a wonderful job as their head coach and the adjustments that he's made. Uh, they have role players there. You thought you were going to have Kawhi and Paul George. Um, now you have Paul George. And I don't know. 
you know, what kind of accommodations can you make for Kawhi Leonard? You know, the, the inner circle says he's high maintenance. Like, those who know the situation will tell you, with Kawhi, there's high maintenance, things that you need to do. It's like Tom Brady, but Kawhi doesn't have the resume that Tom Brady does. Brady is considered high maintenance. One of the reasons why the Raiders didn't want to bring in Tom Brady, because when you bring in Tom, you bring in his trainer, he's got to be on the field, got to be on the plane. Like, there's other things. Like, you, you turn the franchise over to Tom Brady. Tampa was willing to do that. The Raiders reportedly were not. The Lakers did that with LeBron James. But I think that's the interesting part here. Uh, and, and here's the other thing to keep an eye on. The Clippers have played 17 games in the last 36 days. 17 in the last 36. Fatigue is playing a role. If you're shooting... 32% from the floor and 16% from three-point range, it's not going to get any better. His fatigue has certainly set in on this team. Yeah, Paul. Saturday night, though, the Clippers are at home. The Suns shot 36% from the field. The Suns were 4 of 20 from three. That's an opportunity. But the Clippers were 32% from the field, 5 of 31 from three, 16%. 21 of 32 from the free throw line, 65%. Phoenix shooting 36% is the worst field goal percentage by any winning team since 2015. Stat of the day, stat of the day, that best stat of the day, stat of the day. Here comes that what? Stat of the day. Top. Nothing wrong with winning ugly. You just win. And there are going to be times where it's not pretty. And that game on Saturday night, that's the lowest scoring game this season in the NBA. Regular season and postseason. Lowest. You have your opportunity. Devin Booker trying to get adjusted to the mask. Chris Paul is coming back. You know, you got to win that game. If you're the Clippers, you got to win that game. Yeah, uh, McLevin. Have we seen enough out of DeAndre Ayton to make this poll question? If you could redo the 2018 NBA draft, who would you take number one? Ayton, Luka Doncic, or Trey Young? Or is Ayton still not quite there? No, he's not there yet. But I do love what I hear from him, and I love what his teammates say about him. I want you to be great. I want you to want to be great. I want you to listen to Chris Paul. I, I want you to understand your role with Devin Booker. He's really good. And it feels like he's getting better and better and more confident. But I would still take Luca. You know, here's a strange thing about Trey Young. And, and you'll probably not hear this from many people. I would much rather have Trey Young shoot threes than I would let him dribble and get in the lane, get those floaters, get you in foul trouble. I, if, if I'm guarding him, I, I, I let him shoot his three. Now, I don't let him... Do what happened the other night where he's like all alone. He does his little shimmy. But I would let him shoot those threes. I am not letting him get in the lane. Because when he gets in the lane, he gets fouled and he makes his free throws. You want to shoot the three? Go ahead, shoot the three. I'd rather, I'll live and die by that. If, if I'm Milwaukee with Trey Young, then I would allowing him get in the lane. Yes, Bowling. I'm watching Chris Paul and I, I'm like 10 years into not figuring out how he scores points. He kind of meanders to the lane. He's not the quickest guy, but he kind of floats into the lane and just finds that spot, and he hits that little jumper where his feet are about an inch off the ground. He's got a, a normal release. I think the guy's six foot tall or six one. They allow him to have that. Like right. That's, hey, you're not getting to the, the, the hoop, and you're not shooting a three, and we forget about that mid-range jumper. And he just kind of floats in, then he cuts right or left and avoids that six nine dude, and he gets off his shot. And it's fascinating because... He, he knows where he's going, but he's not doing it quickly. Yeah, he's – but, but you know, part of this is you have almost this scientific approach. Like, you, you have to know where you can go. And he finds a spot. You find soft spots. You know, if you look – I guess the analogy would be, you know, Julian Edelman knows where he can go. He knows where to go, and, and you, you know, he's going to be open. Uh, Larry Fitzgerald, like, you just know I can go there. I can get that. That's always going to be there. For, hey, we don't want you to beat us deep. Uh, hey, you know, we, we don't want you crossing over the middle. 
but you find those soft areas. And Durant has made a career out of this as well. And Chris Paul. Now, I don't know if you have younger players. who Younger players are coming up. They want to shoot the three. But there's always going to be room for that mid-range jumper because they've allowed you. They'll give that to you. Like, go ahead, take that. We don't want you drawing fouls, going to the hoop, and we don't want you to burn a shooting threes. You want the 15-footer? Go ahead, take it to your heart's content.